Hello, everyone, and good evening. Um, welcome to the 2020 Women in Clean Energy Conference. We're so excited um, to have everyone here attending tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jen Hoodie, um, and I will be the moderator for the session tonight. I am a fifth year senior at the University of Dayton studying mechanical engineering with a minor in sustainability, energy, and the environment. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is because I've had the privilege to work with some incredible men and women um, to organize and facilitate this conference um, and to transition it into an all virtual event this year. Um, it's no secret that women tend to be underrepresented across the energy field. And this conference was founded on the idea um, that we can bring and get we can get women to the table, not only in the clean energy industry, but in the fight against climate change uh, by providing the resources, knowledge, and connections necessary to build impactful careers in the clean energy field. Uh, so we encourage you to not only listen to our speakers today, but to also be curious, um, to ask questions, and to follow up. Uh, we invite all attendees to submit questions through the Q&A feature during the session. Um, also, feel free to um, comment in the chat box if um, these speakers interact at all. And um, questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentations um, during the final panel session. Um, and if you have any further questions following the event tonight, we will be providing contact information for ourselves and for all the speakers. As we move forward, I would also like to let everyone know that the session will be recorded and that this recording will be posted on our website following the conference. Tonight's session is dedicated to learning how women in different sectors within the clean energy field are committed to using their work to address social implications of climate change. As the threats and consequences of climate change become more and more severe, marginalized and vulnerable communities are disproportionately affected on a local and global scale. The women in tonight's session will provide insight into their work and how clean energy can help build resi resiliency within communities and ensure that clean energy is beneficial for everyone. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Natasha Wright, an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Her research and teaching interests include membrane-based separation processes, desalination, photovoltaic, photovoltaic and solar thermal water treatment, design of ethnography, and the role of engineering in global development. I had the privilege to work with Dr. Natasha Wright this past summer, um, so it is my pleasure to hand it over to Natasha. Hey everyone, Jen, it looks like I don't have control yet. There we go. Oh, let's bring it back. All right, thank you everyone. So um, thanks for the introduction, Jen. As you said, my name is Professor Natasha Wright. Um, I'm at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Mechanical Ener Engineering. Um, I actually just recently moved to the University of Minnesota in the last year. I was previously in the Global Engineering and Research Lab at MIT. And so some of the work I'll be presenting today is from that lab. So just would like to put that out there to acknowledge my colleagues there as well. I'm gonna be talking about a few different things today. First is the role of desalination in global development specifically. Desalination just removing, means removing the salt from a salty water stream. So for example, taking the salt out of seawater or out of a groundwater source. I'll also be exploring the ener water energy nexus and explaining what that means. So the water energy nexus, if you haven't heard that before, sometimes the water energy food nexus, is the idea that these three items, water, energy, and food, or in this case, water and energy, are very closely coupled. Water is used to create or perhaps transform most of our energy sources. We do that, for example, by using water to cool large electric, uh, electrical plants. We also uh, need energy in order to transport, heat, cool, extract, treat, and dispose of water. And so these two systems are really closely coupled and often can be used uh, together to be mutually beneficial and to provide both water and energy. So the majority of my talk today is actually focused on water and innovations I've had in the water uh, uh, water sphere, but doing, uh, but all of those decisions were essentially driven by the need to make these systems off grid for the communities that we were serving and working with. And so uh, I'll be focusing on desalination, thinking about why desalination is so energy intensive to begin with, how we might be able to use less energy, 
how we can consider moving off grid with small scale and decentralized desalination systems, and why this might be of particular interest in low and middle income countries. That's the acronym LIMC that you'll see a few times throughout this presentation. We know that uh, water scarcity isn't an issue just in resource constrained issue in resource constrained settings. It's actually an issue pretty much everywhere in the world today. In this figure, we see the global water uh, one look at the global water scarcity. And so the areas where we have darker red are places where uh, are countries where we are more likely to experience many months of water scarcity in the in the recent years. When most people think of desalination as a way of helping to mitigate water scarcity, you think of desalinating seawater. Uh, there's a reason for that. We have a lot of seawater. However, there's also a large capacity globally for brackish groundwater desalination. And actually about 40% of the total desalination capacity that's currently installed is treating brackish water. And that's water that's salty, uh, but not quite as salty as seawater typically, and is found underground in aquifers around the world. Uh, that capacity, 40% of the total global capacity, translates to about 40.7 million cubic meters per day. So this is already a very large market looking at brackish water desalination. Now, when I first started my work, I wasn't actually looking at desalination at all. I was focused predominantly on removing uh, microbial contamination from drinking water in rural areas of India, or at least that's what I had been tasked to look at and to investigate. I started um, doing what we call design ethnography in my group, which meant that I spent a lot of time um, interacting and communicating with members of the entire stakeholder chain. So that includes both people that are using water treatment devices, government officials, uh, large scale manufacturers that can manufacture different systems. And one of those meetings here was with a group of uh, the village women's group in a, in a community in India. And this particular photo was taken in January of 2013, and we're discussing the two-part silver water, or uh, that uh, aluminum water filter that you see there. And so what you see is it's, a, it's actually two compartments, and you put water in the top, and water drains down into the bottom compartment through a clay candlestick filter. But what most of the women here were telling me is that they had either purchased or been given this filter, but only used it about one month during the year. And when they used it, it, they were using it because the water looked brown because it was during the rainy season and there was a lot of mud, muddy in the water and kind of more visual cues that the water was dirty. But they weren't using it in other times of the year. And when I dug into that deeper, we found that that was actually the case in many of the communities we were meeting with, that they had various forms of water treatment devices, but that even with these water treatment devices, they found their water hard to digest. They found that it didn't taste very good. Some specifically even said that it tasted salty. And that it, most importantly, that even the plastic ones, and when we say that they're referring to these um, kind of industrial pretty looking ones on the right side of the screen, still have the same salty taste. And so we started digging into that deeper and trying to understand why uh, with all of these existing devices, are people still having this salty taste in their water and how is that inhibiting their ability to find clean drinking water sources? So uh, general background, about 70% of the rural population does not treat their drinking water in India. Some of that is um, affordability of water filtration sources. Some of that is education, obviously. Some of that is also access to these filters. Um, however, the more and more we talked to the people in the region we were working in, which was in Maharashtra state and sort of central India, the more we discovered that there was this disconnect between some of the filters that were being offered and either for purchase or donation based um, versus what was actually being treated and what needed to be treated in their community. And so uh, over 60% of the land area in India is actually underlain with groundwater that is saltier than you should have in your drinking water supply. So that's over about 500 or 600 milligrams per liter. That's everything that uh, is green, yellow, and red on the map on the left here. And so since these communities we were meeting with were in some of those yellow and green regions, it made sense that they were telling us the water was salty because the filters that they had received or purchased was not removing the salt from the water. And that created an aesthetic barrier to having clean water. It only really matters if groundwater is salty, if people are actually drinking it. 
Um, we can also look at the Census, uh, uh, Census Bureau data and see that that is the case. About 60.5% of folks are using groundwater directly. Another 34% um, use water that's being piped into the home. Most of that is actually also from groundwater sources. And so there's, there seems to be a large percentage of the population that is likely accessing salty water sources. So I started to uh, look more closely into how uh, uh, salt can be removed in these communities, which brought me to looking at desalination. In this figure on the right, there is also, I'll point out a, through a little red box around community RO plant um, at less than 1% of the total systems that are current, are current uh, methods of supplying water in communities. So what is a reverse osmosis system? Reverse osmosis system, um, this is what one would typically look in one of these rural communities, but it's a pressure-based a membrane based system in which you apply a high pressure to one side of the membrane and force uh, clean water through the membrane. Because it requires high pressures, it also requires a lot of energy, even if it's a small volume. So Tata Projects, one of the corporate um, companies that have been sponsoring or that sponsored much of this work, um, actually has had quite a bit of success of installing these on grid reverse osmosis systems across the country. But the struggle they've had is that when they've tried to um, interact or install systems in off-grid communities in places where there is less reliable energy available, the system no longer, the economics of the system no longer work out because they need too big of a power system and the capital cost gets too high that the funding institutions aren't okay with the payback period of the system. That high energy comes from a few different things. The first, as I mentioned, is it requires pressure to force water through the membrane. When you do that um, and combine that issue with really low efficiency pumps, which is what you often get for two reasons. One, because it's a small pump and small pumps are less efficient typically than big pumps. And also because uh, these pumps are often, uh, at least the locally made pumps tend to be kind of knockoffs of some other brands. And so they aren't made perhaps to as high of quality as others. And so the pumps tend to be lower efficiency. Um, in addition, sometimes when you have a low efficiency pump or just a pump in general at high pressure, you can actually recover some of that pressure uh, in the system in order to reduce your energy consumption. But that's also harder at a small scale. It's usually not cost effective for Tata projects to install one of those systems or they're not even able to source one. Uh, to give you a sense of that, this plant as a whole you know, is on the order of 2000 US dollars. Um, and some of these pumps, when, when people say, oh, why don't you just put in an 80% efficient pump? Well, most of those pumps are over $1,000 just for the pump itself. So that's not really an option within the economics that we're talking about. Okay, so that's reverse osmosis. Um, when we started digging into this issue of how do we create desalination systems that are cost effective to be in off-grid areas and cost effective meaning not based um, solely on donation, but actually able to recover the operating and capital cost of the system. We started to uh, think about, again, going back to these maps and where, uh, what type of energy system we would be looking at if we were trying to go off-grid. So again, we have our groundwater salinity map with most things in the range of 500 and 200 milligrams per liter. Most of, or many of the regions that are high salinity overlap with areas of high water stress in India. So we know that the groundwater is probably deeper, for example. Uh, if the groundwater is deeper, it means that it's gonna take us more energy just to get the water up to the surface. And so that becomes a critical factor. And then we also looked at wind, solar, uh, geothermal, other types of maps for the country and found that although there is intermittent uh, uh, on-grid energy supply currently in India that the high, they have a very high solar resource and that that high solar resource uh, overlaps with many of these areas of high water stress and groundwater salinity. As a result of some of these things we started to think about uh, what that meant. So one we need a desalination system that couples could couple nicely with solar power. We also started to think about um, this idea that water scarcity is a big issue, groundwater is, is the available groundwater is deep. And so we wanna pull up the least amount of water possible. And in order to do that, we need a system that can actually recover a lot of water. And when we talk about desalination water recovery, we're saying we want to get the most product water out of whatever we feed into the system. And so we wanted a high recovery system. When we started thinking about those metrics, we, um, 
I started thinking about a process called electrodialysis. And I'm not going to get too much into the physics. I know not everyone here is an engineer or a scientist that maybe is interested in that, but just the very basics of how this system works. So if you have cations and anions, those are positive and negative charges. You can think of the table salt you find in your kitchen. That's sodium chloride. So let's say your sodium is your cation. It has a positive charge. That sodium is, want, is going to want to go towards the cathode or this negatively charged plate on one side where your anion or your chloride is going to want to go the other way. And so by applying a voltage on these two plates, I can actually attract the salt towards the two plates. What makes electrodialysis um, unique is that you also have this series of membranes in between the, the cathode and the anode. And these membranes help to separate the salts into alternating channel, the channels of diluent, which is what we call the clean water, and concentrate, which is the, the dirty water or the highly concentrated water. So this technology um, often looks uh, like this. This is one by GE Water, which was actually purchased by Suez. So the one on the left would be Suez Water Technologies stack. The one on the right is Ion Tech, which is on the right is Ion Tech, which is a company out of China. And so both of these stacks have really big flat uh, membranes that are squished between these two electrode plates. And when you start to think about how these systems work, we start to understand that because they have these long flow channels of uh, flat plates, they're not able to use the voltage that you apply very well. So the first thing that I worked on in my research was thinking, I'm going to skip that slide. We'll come back to that if anyone's interested. But the first thing that I worked on uh, was looking at how do you tune the voltage across subsequent stages of electrodialysis stacks in order to use the power you have available the most efficiently as you can, as efficiently as you can. This becomes really critical because in a solar powered system, the amount of power you have available varies throughout the day. And so when you try to couple a solar system with a desalination system, you need to think about um, not only what is my base load for my desalination system, but how might I be able to capture that really high energy I have during the day and maybe avoid some of the losses of just storing that in a battery. Maybe I can create more water during that time, or maybe I can create less salty water during that time in order to actively utilize that power and avoid some of the conversion losses with batteries. We also started to think about, well, what if we don't want that variable supply for reasons of uh, control complexity? How might I be able to change the design of the electrodialysis stack itself to make it do what we want it to do solely based on the geometry? And so that's where my research started looking at these spiral wound stacks and how by applying a constant voltage, I can actually get the correct power or energy where I want it in the stack just by the nature of the fact that it's a spiral. So those are kind of two of the directions that research went. Uh, we did end up installing systems um, in a, uh, many different places around the world. The first one was actually part of the USA desal prize, uh, which took place in Alamogordo, New Mexico. This was a competition between a variety of different companies um, and, uh, and academic institutions. We had a specific um, set of requirements based on water quality, production rate, and recovery that we had to hit. Um, and so we did win first prize at this competition, but I'll note that the system was very raw at the time. Uh, you can see in the photo below, there's kind of tubes going everywhere, and it's definitely not something that could be installed in the community. Since then, we have uh, pilot systems, piloted systems in Jalgao, India, um, in Chaluru, India. Uh, when we switched from Jalgao to Chaluru, we ended up trying to do a fully manually based system. I can get all into what it takes to maintain a system in some of these contexts, but we were playing around with some of the user factors associated with the system here. Um, currently where we're at is that there's these TQ malls around India, which are uh, being installed by Tata Projects, the company I mentioned at gas stations around the country, around the country, um, and they are being uh, there we're trying to install these electrodialysis desalination systems in the end, kind of in that end section of the TQ mall to provide water um, in these outside spigots and then the solar power system would be attached on the side or on the top. The second big piece that I'm now thinking about more readily because yes, the energy related to the actual desalination process is big and that's what most people think about is the fact that it's not just product water that comes out, there's also brine that comes out of any desalination system. Now this is um, actually a 
a fairly massive issue no matter where you are. Even big desalination plants in the US have the same issue. So for example, here in Minnesota, which is where I'm uh, calling in from today, we're worried about chloride and sulfate getting into surface water sources in our, in our many lakes and rivers, which is part of what Minnesota is known for. And so our Minnesota uh, Pollution Control Agency investigated what it would take to install desalination systems at our wastewater treatment plants. And essentially what they found is that while it was a possibility to install these, waste, these wastewater treatment plant desalination systems, the cost of the brine would be, uh, the cost of treating the brine would actually be what makes it economically infeasible. Now, why does it cost so much to treat brine? Well, the saltier your water is, like the, the wastewater that comes out of your desalination plant is really concentrated with salt. And as a result, it's even harder to evaporate the water from that stream. And so the systems tend to be really energy intensive. From that same study in Minnesota, they found that the brine management would actually account for about 63% of the capital cost and more than 91% of the operation and maintenance cost. When we say operation and maintenance, yes, there's maintenance involved in that, but a big portion of that is the energy. So again, we're back to this kind of um, th this interaction between how do we get clean water and how do we do it for the least amount of energy as possible. What's typically done um, for inland desalination plants is either one of two things. First is that you could use a large-scale thermal evaporator or crystallator, crystal, <laughs> crystallizer, which I've shown in this image. Obviously, this is for a much larger plant than the systems I consider in India, which is part of the issue because you can't just scale this plant down um, very easily. The physics don't really work to just scale this plant down and put it in a community. Um, the other option would be to take that same type, instead of that type of system, you could just use a basic evaporation pond. The problem with evaporation ponds is that they take a lot of land area um, relative to the size of the plant itself. So for example, if I was going to take this same thermal evaporator on the left, which is from a desalination plant in the southwestern United States, and instead do an evaporation pond, I would need a lot of land area. So it's not just one football field, it's actually about a hundred football fields worth of evaporative area in order to do what that same thermal uh, crystallizer can do. That's why we often use thermal crystallizers for inland desal uh, brine treatment. But our issue is that you can't, that installing even these evaporation ponds in the communities that I work in is often quite challenging. There's a lot of regulation uh, in the US and starting to be a lot of regulation in India related to the specific liners that can be used for these evaporation ponds. And they just take up land area that often doesn't exist. It's usually someone's only farming property, for example. And so we started to think about how can we um, treat this wastewater, this really salty, briny wastewater, using less. And if you think about uh, one way I think to think intuitively about this is if when you're out for a run and your body starts sweating and you're trying to, that's, you're sweating because you're getting hot and you're doing that to cool yourself down. And as you're running, the faster you're running, it's going to feel cooler because your sweat is evaporating off your body. Similarly, in cold weather, <laughs> that also, uh, that same effect also happens and you're still evaporating water off. So what we started to think about is this idea that what's really going on is that you're just affecting, when you're evaporating water in these highly briny systems, you're essentially affecting three variables. You're affecting the wind speed, you're affecting the temperature of the water, and you're trying to play around with the humidity. And so we started thinking about ways of enhancing the evaporation area. This is actually from a technology called a wave or wind-aided intensified evaporation, uh, which was developed out of Ben-Gurion University in Israel. Uh, they've increased evaporation area by using these vertical hanging sheets and spraying brine on it. They're then using the natural power of the wind in order to evaporate more water. The issue with that is that it's not very resistant to different climatic changes. So it works really well in really dry and hot areas, but it tends to work less well um, in areas where it's more humid um, or cooler out. And so what we're trying to do, and actually the project that Jen was helping us work on this summer, is that we're, we're developing a system that enhances evaporation area in a similar way, but also increases wind speed 
by introducing a fan only during times of low wind or high humidity. So essentially, kind of like when we were talking about evening out that solar trajectory curve and the idea that sometimes you have a lot of solar and sometimes you don't, how can we use natural availability when it's there and augment when it's not to still make sure that the system's feasible? And then finally, we're also providing control of the incoming brine temperature. And so in order to do that, and in order to do this off-grid, that means we're thinking about a variety of different energy sources and technologies. Specifically, um, we're looking at both photovoltaic power or PV panels, solar panels, um, to drive uh, pumps and fans, but we're also looking at solar concentrating units to increase the temperature of the brine to make that part of the process more efficient. And the whole goal is to say, how do we, how can we evaporate uh, or treat wastewater? How can we desalinate using the least amount of natural energy resource? Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. I wasn't sure how in-depth people might have questions on the technology itself versus maybe the process that we use when we're working in international development. So I'm happy to answer any of those types of questions. Um, we have a variety of in, uh, organizations that have funded this work that I should thank. And then I also just wanted to say that sometimes school can be really hard and it's really, I'm so glad that a Jen and team have put together an organization like this to try to bring women together through those challenges. Um, this is a picture of myself. I, during grad school, I had just received a really expensive electrodialysis stack and I ran it into a brick wall <laughs> and it cracked a component and it was, it was just a disaster. It was a really bad day. And so I know that those days happen. Um, and I think it's, it's important that we have a community that can support each other through those moments and that can talk through challenges as well as successes. Um, so I'm happy to answer any of those types of questions about you know, what didn't go right as well and how do you overcome those types of challenges. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker and I'm happy to uh, answer questions at the end. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, I would now like to introduce our second speaker for tonight, Crystal Lehman. Um, Crystal is a Supervisory Emergency Management Specialist at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, previously, she worked as a Policy Advisor for the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office and the Department of Energy's Office of Policy and Systems Analysis. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Crystal. Hi, let's see if I make sure I can do this. One moment. Oh, one moment, everyone. There we go. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Crystal Lehman. Um, a quick disclaimer before we go into the fun information. The views and opinions expressed in this PowerPoint are those of me and do not reflect the official policy or position of any agency of the U.S. government. Information and analysis are not reflective of the position of any U.S. government entity. All right, with that bureaucracy out of the way, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. I think it's really important to promote uh, women in STEM, and I think it's really great that we are focusing on the social impact of clean energy. Um, first, so this slide is just uh, something I put together because I realized that you are all very lucky. Um, there are a multitude of career paths if you are interested in clean energy. It is not like how I was in my undergrad or even my grad school days, but I think depending on where you want to go, there's a lot of different opportunities. My perspective is primarily from the public sector. And um, like most of you, uh, I was very interested in the science. And I'm actually environmental science, but I love all science. And I think it's really great to see that right now there's a lot of opportunity uh, for people interested in this space. Uh, just a little bit about my journey. Um, I knew pretty early I wanted to be involved in the public sector. I did one of my first internships at California EPA, so California Environmental Protection Agency. Each state has their own energy or environmental state agency. And during this period, it was actually during the Arnold Schwarzenegger administration, which was a really prime time because he was very interested 
in reducing greenhouse gases for the state. So there's a lot of activity in that space at that time. Um, I ended up moving out to New York City where I ended up interning at the United Nations. And that was neat because also that was a little bit of a global point of view um, coming from a state perspective. And then I settled myself into Washington, D.C. Um, I got a position at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in D.C. and I was working in the Climate Change Division. And this was during the Clean Power Plan, so there was a lot of activity, uh, a lot of need for good scientists, and I was able to get involved in some really interesting work there. And then at the U.S. Department of Energy, they needed a climate expert, so I was able to hop over there. And then finally, I am now at FEMA. Um, as you probably all are well aware, there is a lot of activity and um, I think it's really great to serve. And I'll just make a quick plug for public service. Um, you can have many different paths in your career and I would encourage you if the opportunity does present itself to consider serving the public. Um, I have found it to be very, very, fulfilling. I've also found it to be one of the, um, the best ways if you want to help your community. Um, and also public service oftentimes leads other sectors as well. And I found that, you know, depending on the decision making process, there's a lot that you can do in this sector. So I just want to make a quick plug um, for serving uh, if that is your interest. So I want to take a quick step back uh, about some of the work that I've done in the public sphere. Um, we, we've been seeing um, with a lot of the activity occurring in the energy sector, um, one piece that has been missing oftentimes, not intentionally of course, but oftentimes has been missing is the the move through to, to try to represent everyone in the community and also provide access and equity in the community. I found this uh, from a colleague of mine that I actually really like. Um, that kind of shows the differences of what we are trying to achieve often when it comes to clean energy. Um, you have here equality, the assumption that everyone benefits from the same support, so that's equal treatment. You also have equity, so depending on where you are, um, adding some more support as appropriate. And then there's justice. And really that is you take down the barrier that was there that caused the inequity in the first place. And so I'm trying to add this lens into to energy. Uh, and I did that at the US Department of Energy before I ended my position there. But I think it's really important to see that oftentimes we don't take that into account when we are developing programs or even when we are implementing programs. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, so energy source and costs do matter. Uh, so here's some pieces of information, some statistics here that, that comes from um, the Department of Energy, but then also from the US Census Bureau, uh, that really there is oftentimes a very high energy burden. And it's not very, I, I, re I realize we're all virtual, it can be very interactive, but um, if those that know what energy burden is, I, I would be like very impressed. Um, but energy burden essentially means that uh, the amount, the percent that you pay in your energy bill to the amount that you earn from your income, that the amount yearly that you're earning from your income. And what that means is that um, depending on, on the cost of your energy, it could be pretty detrimental to your income if you're paying a very high percentage. So we have seen in some of the analysis being done by the US Department of Energy that you can pay up to 30% of your income on energy. And oftentimes, you don't have a choice when it comes to the energy bills, right? Like you, you pay your energy bills to keep the lights on, to keep the heat running, to keep the air conditioning going, depending on what's occurring outside. And it's really important to, to make sure you're comfortable because um, sometimes depending on if you're elderly or if you're in a vulnerable population, um, it can really make a difference when it comes to the comfort and survival uh, in your own home. Um, right now, uh, we have about 44% or about 50 million are defined as low income. Uh, and that's quite a lot. 
um, and including those people into the energy dialogue is actually very important. This graph, not graph, this map here um, is a wonderful tool that the US Department of Energy developed that really looks into a, at a deep dive at some of the areas throughout the, the United States of what the energy burden is and how much down to the census level people are spending on their energy bill. It's, a, it's pretty eye-opening and has been cited now since its release last year by um, uh, several um, state, uh, well, actually one state law, but it's been cited several times. Um, so what are some of the solutions here? So one major solution is energy efficiency. Um, and since this is a topic on clean energy impacts, I will recognize energy efficiency is very important, but I'll go ahead and dive a little bit into clean energy. By clean energy for, for this conversation, I'm talking about solar. Um, solar has been really impressive the past five, 10 years of how much has gone down in cost. It's been unprecedented. It's, it's really, really impressive and remarkable. Um, and I think it's still, it's still becoming a more accessible uh, form of clean energy. However, there are still barriers. Um, oftentimes, you will not have suitable roof space. Um, I would not be surprised if most of you on this call rent and don't have access to your roof and you don't own your home. Um, there is still financial barriers. So for example, there is still high upfront expenses. Um, and also there's not a clear, oftentimes easy way of getting solar financed either. Um, there can be um, issues with the fact that you might need a, a low credit score or you might need to have um, a, a certain interest rate to be even viable. A lot of these issues still exist. Um, uh, one activity that we've seen, oops, one activity that we've seen is that many states, uh, including the District of Columbia, have been really taking this to heart. And they have seen that it really does make a difference when you build policy that surrounds and includes areas that are disadvantaged. Um, this is a, a wonderful analysis by NREL, taking a look at which areas have tried to do this. And I think also just to point out that it really does matter um, when, when governments do take into consideration these areas. Uh, we've seen in Washington, D.C., uh, the District of Columbia have a very ambitious goal of 100,000 families um, receiving benefits from clean energy. So we've seen this um, great ambition and we hope to see, I hope to see it continue. You'd think I would learn how to use this virtually by now. <laughs> um, the value of increasing affordability and access to clean energy. There's a lot of different pieces I can, can mention here, but I just highlighted a few. So decreasing energy burden, that really does make a difference. It allows people and families to, to use that money towards groceries or to medicine or to other items than energy. Um, I mentioned the challenge of renters versus owners. I think uh, it's really important to note that a lot of people are are renters and they actually showed that about 59% of low income households are, renter, are renters, which is a pretty significant amount. Um, and then uh, the increasing of benefits for these potential solar adopters. Um, we ha I mentioned before, it has been a very impressive 10 decade, you know, when it comes to, to, um, to solar. But a lot of that has been unfortunately disproportionate. A lot of it has been going to moderate income and not to low income. I'm gonna pivot just for a minute and I'm keeping track of time. I thought I put my, someone will let me know. Okay, so I'm just gonna pivot and I'll go through this pretty quickly just to respect the other speaker. Um, Another important aspect of impacts of clean energy is resiliency, and it does matter. Um, we have seen that those that are disproportionately affected by disasters 
are usually low income communities. Um, and then compounding on top of that, these low income communities usually don't have the resources in order to combat these adverse effects. Um, this, this picture here demonstrates the extent of these disasters. They have cost a lot of money. And in the billions of dollars in the past five years, we have seen an increase of this amount. So really preparing these communities for success is essential. Uh, energy is a solution. I think that also energy can be a challenge when it comes to some of these activities. This is a graph from uh, the most recent PBS report where it looked at, unfortunately, power lines being a, a, um, an issue when it comes to some of the wildfires that are being seen in California. So recognizing there's much more to do than, than um, preparing for an event. I mentioned briefly that when I first started at the US Department of Energy, I worked on a program, or hopefully I mentioned it, I worked on a program that uh, focused on communities on their action plans. Uh, it was called the Climate Action Champions, and we worked with about 20 different communities on how they can fulfill their action plans. One of the communities was Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe, and they are in Northern California, pretty Northern California, and they have done an impressive job at working to, with the community and implementing a microgrid. Um, so Blue Lake Rancheria is a federally recognized tribe, and notably, the tribe has built two low carbon microgrids that are able to island from the regional electricity grid during an emergency event and can provide government offices and other shelter in place facilities um, with what they need. It is a community scale microgrid with about 420 kilowatts and 500 kilowatt hour battery storage system power at six building campuses. It also serves as a Red Cross shelter as well. And what were some of the results? They were able to see the results pretty quickly amid some of the, the shutoffs that were occurring in California. They were, they were really impressive with the amount of support that they were able to receive from their microgrid and able to actually help their community at large. They've been recognized by FEMA, they've been recognized by Department of Energy as really a marquee example of finding solutions, clean energy solutions to really help their community. Um, so this is just a little bit of a rehash of what I mentioned, uh, the importance of solar plus storage, the importance of microgrids, which is uh, basically islanding. And importantly, I, I didn't mention this previously, but community solar. Um, community solar is a really important way if you don't have access um, to have, if you don't have access to solar for your own home, community solar in either a community center or a utility or even in a field is a really important way to have access to solar um, and use the clean, clean energy benefits. Um, and that is actually also what Blue Lake Rancheria has as well, is a, a community solar array. And lastly, some quick career advice. I only have a couple that I just want to share. I think it's really important, uh, especially when you're looking into this field, to expose yourself to different sectors uh, and really find out what you enjoy doing. Um, I think that means you can start in any sector and move around, or if you like what you're doing in one sector, keep it going, but find different avenues to do something different. Uh, if you can, find your mission space. And when I say mission space, I mean, um, find some sort of expertise that you really enjoy and cultivate that. And you can become the expert of that um, anywhere you go, depending on, it doesn't really depend on the, the sector. If you like it, write as much as you can. I think it really helps you distill information and create a deep skill that is often difficult to find, which is sharing complex information in a concise way. 
Uh, and finally, be kind to yourself. Uh, there's no right path and it's okay to pivot and take risks. Uh, people do notice when you're a hard worker and when you work well with others. So it's okay, don't worry about um, what's happening. Um, oftentimes these items, you know, these activities are, are very small in your life, but when you find something you like, it really does make a difference. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and close uh, and leave you just with a quote that I heard from a colleague years ago and always remember, unless you intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. And I keep that with me for, for a long time. And with that, I'll end and move on to the next speaker. Awesome, thank you so much, Crystal. Um, finally, I would like to introduce our last speaker of the session tonight, um, who is Marie McConnell. Uh, Marie supports Clean, um, Clean Fuels Ohio's Drive Electric Ohio program as outreach and organizing manager. Uh, she mobilizes Drive Electric Ohio's locally based EV education and advocacy programs, working with them to conduct consumer education activities, encourage development of EG char EV charging, and address local and state policy. Um, it is now my pleasure to hand it over to Marie. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what all the other speakers were saying and just say thank you so much for putting this on. I am so excited to be here. Uh, I actually attended this conference last year as a recent college grad who was trying to kind of figure out the industry. Um, and so to be here and be able to speak about my kind of niche area of the energy space is so, so exciting. Um, so with that, I wanted to Oh, I did want to give a disclaimer that I have a lot of goofy pictures of myself on various electric transportation devices, and I never get to use them for anything. So I went a little overboard with this presentation, so I apologize if it's a little cheesy. Um, but that's me on an e-bike, and that's me with an electric vehicle charger. So I'm um, very excited to be able to use these pictures finally. Um, but a little background on myself. Um, I graduated from Ohio State with a degree in environmental policy. Um, I specialized in government relations and I was a women's studies minor. So um, very, very soft sciences. So if that sounds like you, there is still a place for you um, in energy. Um, we need all types of people with all types of background to do this work successfully. Um, I didn't have any sort of intention to get involved with transportation. Um, it really kind of happened by accident. Um, I had a friend who was graduating and needed somebody to fill her internship spot. And I took over her position with the Electrification Coalition. Um, and I kind of fell in love with it. Um, I had a really unique opportunity to work on the Smart Columbus project, which was the US Department of Transportation's Smart City Challenge. Um, so it was a grant program that was looking at transportation solutions, um, it really focusing on mobility. So transportation as it applies to people's needs and people's lives. Um, since that program has kind of wrapped up, um, I've moved on to a full time position, as Jen mentioned, with Clean Fuels Ohio. Um, Clean Fuels Ohio is a US Department of Energy Clean Cities Coalition, which means we are a nonprofit organization, but we work with federal energy labs, um, government agencies, and other clean cities coalitions to do alternative fuels work. Um, so as an organization, we are fuel and technology neutral, which means we do natural gas, we do propane, we do hydrogen, um, we do electric, we kind of run the gamut of all of the options that, uh, that vehicles can have right now. Um, and beyond just vehicles themselves, we work with uh, refueling infrastructure and the policy that surrounds all of these things. So I specifically um, work on the Drive Electric Ohio initiative. So I am only focusing on electric vehicles. And right now that means primarily light duty or light duty electric vehicles. Um, so all of the policy work um, to create both production and demand side policies, um, working with utilities to make sure that we have the power to and the infrastructure to, to, to fuel these vehicles, um, rolling out charging systems, um, working with dealers and vehicle manufacturers um, and sort of underlying all this work 
you know, we are doing consumer education and we are applying a grassroots organizing approach to it. So I work with chapters of volunteers who we mobilize um, to go out and, and to be educating their friends and their neighbors and contacting their legislators um, to keep their ball rolling and to really expand our impact. Um, and thinking throughout all of these things is, you know, how do we ensure that everyone from all communities, rural, urban, low income, moderate income, et cetera, have access to this technology and specifically access to the benefits of this technology. So since this is a social impact panel, um, I wanted to share uh, a quote from my favorite TED talk of all time, um, The Economic Injustice of Plastic by Van Jones. Um, Van Jones is a criminal justice advocate and a clean jobs um, advocate. So, you know, tying together those, the social and the uh, environmental justice pieces here. Um, and basically, you know, I won't read the whole thing to you, but it says, you know, when you were a kid, people told you that you could care about one issue, right? You know, there's a whole world out there. You can only do so much good, pick an issue. Um, and so this quote here, it says, Fun fundamentally, they told you, are you going to hug a tree or are you going to hug a child? Pick. What are you going to do? And when you start to work on issues like this, for, for Van Jones, it was plastic pollution. Um, when you start to work on issues like this, you realize that the whole thing is connected. And luckily, most, most of us are blessed to have two arms that we can hug both. Um, so this was really a light bulb moment for me. Um, and so, you know, this TED Talk talks about plastic and pollution, but, but for me, the, the way that we hug both is by solving for transportation. Um, so, you know, most people take transportation for granted, my, myself included. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to, to be able to afford a car to get where I need to go. Right. Um, and, and we a lot of us can can start to draw the connections between transportation and air quality and smog and definitely start thinking about carbon emissions and things like that. But I mean, you really when you start to zoom out. Transportation is the thing that connects so many issues. Right. So, you know, how do you get to school every day? How do you get to work every day? You know, um, if you miss your bus are you potentially losing your job if your car breaks down and you can't afford to fix it do your kids not get to go to school or their their after school activities um and i think it's really important to talk about specifically um the role that transportation plays in women's lives right because you know largely we are dependent on transportation for our our jobs and our paid labor right but we're also really dependent on transportation for our unpaid labor you think about who are the people that are dropping kids off at daycare or going to get groceries or taking grandma to the doctor, right? Largely, those are women who, you know, tend to have fewer hours in the day anyway. If, if you don't have access to reliable transportation, you know, suddenly these daily tasks can, can take two or four times as long to get done. So, <clears throat> So this is sort of that connection between transportation, environmental, social issues, right? But how is energy playing into this as well? Because that's a very important uh, layer to the conversation. Um, so, you know, when you look at the U.S.'s energy demand as a whole, um, over a third of that demand is for oil. And of that, of that oil, you know, 70% of it is going to transportation, right? Some of it's going to manufacturing, some of it's going to heating. Right, but the bulk of the oil that the U.S. consumes is going to our transportation sector. And we are seeing, right, we are all living 2020 together. We are seeing that the, the emissions that are, are vastly coming from transportation, this can't keep happening, right? We are past, we're at the, the point of no return, right? And we have to solve for transportation. We can't keep running this sector the way that it's running. So, you know, how does, electrifying our tech transportation sector, how do electric vehicles solve for these issues, right? So the most common feedback, critique, criticism that I hear probably every day, right, is that EVs, electric vehicles are fun, flashy pieces of technology, you know, for rich people, for Silicon Valley, tech bros, you know, for YouTubers, whoever, right? So how is this solving for any issues? Isn't, isn't this just causing more issues? So, I mean, right off the bat, um, electric vehicles are better for 
uh, our air quality and for our environment right now. You know, even in our current electric grid, which is mixed, is often fossil fuel um, majority. Um, you know, even today, right now, and the, this math is even a little bit outdated, right? If you drove on electricity right now, you would be um, you be far outperforming what you would be doing in an, a gasoline powered vehicle, right? So it's not only less carbon intensive, um, there's no tailpipe emissions. So you're not actively, con uh, sorry, <clears throat> you're not actively polluting the communities that you live and work and play in. Um, aside from that, you know, electric vehicles are proving themselves to be more cost, um, more cost effective over time, right? So when we think about um, a, a significant number of vehicles on our roads are fleet vehicles, they're not personal vehicles, right? So there's a really compelling argument to be made for, for people who might not care about the environmental or the energy efficiency uh, argument, but if you can tell them, you know, hey, if you switch your fleet to electric vehicles, you are going to save money every year in fuel costs, in maintenance, and all of these things. Um, that's really powerful. Um, and another piece I always like to, to, to bring up, because when you start to think about our current transportation system, um, the fact that we drive our vehicles until we're out of gas and make special trips to gas stations is so silly. When you think about the fact that our cars are parked 95% of their life. So potentially that's 95% of the time that your car could be plugged in and proactively charging rather than reactively refueling. And lastly, and potentially the most interesting piece of this puzzle is the way that electric vehicles are priming us all for smarter uh, transportation and cleaner energy in the future. So um, electric vehicles are much more compatible with AI and autonomous technology. Um, so there is a huge, you know, fuel reduction potential with connected vehicle environments. Um, and when you think about the fact that, you know, if you hit the brakes in your car, that's a very mechanical process that takes time. So if you were trying to, um, you know, collect data on that, transmit that data to another car so it could react to you slowing down, that's not realistic in the current vehicles that we have. You know, electric, electric vehicles that are generating, um, generating and collecting data instantaneously, that's what we need to do to have smart infrastructure and smart vehicle ecosystems in the future. Um, and kind of on the bigger picture there, right? Electric vehicles are just really big batteries on wheels, right? So there's huge potential for electric vehicles in smoothing out demand curves um, for electricity usage. Um, and especially when we look at issues that come with renewables about when are peak times of production versus demand, um, electric vehicles can really help smooth that out and lower costs for all users. Um, one of my favorite kind of applications of EVs is for the city of Miami, who recently is in, um, announced they were investing in electric buses for their public transportation fleet. Um, and one of the major, major reasons that they cited for investing in these buses is, you know, they said, we know that horrible and worse and worse hurricanes are coming. It's really not a question of if anymore, it's a question of when. And if you have a fleet of fully charged buses and a hurricane hits and wipes out your power, you now have multiple generators on wheels that you can drive to hospitals or shelters or food banks. And there's a really interesting resiliency piece there that I think is um, an interesting part of this conversation. So I think I'm going to end a little bit early. I tend to talk fast when I get nervous, um, but I did want to pose the question of why electric vehicles again, right? Because, you know, we've talked about all these benefits and, and we see these benefits across the whole range of vehicles, right? Light duty personal cars to media duty uh, delivery vans to heavy duty school buses and semi trucks, right? But why are we spending so much time and money and attention on electric cars specifically when, you know, there's a lot to be said about problems that we're facing coming from the fact that so many of us own so many cars, right? I think the average family in the U.S. owns 2.5 cars or something, which is crazy, right? That's more cars than people. 
Um, so I, you know, wanted to share this tweet. Um, then this was tweeted by a friend of mine. I'll be honest, this was a bit of a subtweet directed at me. Um, so I wanted to just share this critique, right? And it says, all of this work in smart cities, in technology, in, you know, electric vehicles as a whole, right? If, if we think back to the really great graphic that Crystal shared about the fences and the, the step stools and the, the full wall, right? It's like a lot of these things don't seem like they're really working to eliminate the barriers, right? You know, replacing all of these gasoline cars with electric cars, that doesn't solve the problem, right? That's a temporary band-aid. So that's a really valid critique. Um, and, you know, I think about this a lot. And my response to this is, you know, when we imagine a beautiful, perfect, utopian society with, with amazing transportation that's shared and electric and autonomous and connected, right? There's still a role for, for cars in that. Um, they might be rideshare, they might be delivery cars, you know, they might be something bigger like an ambulance, um, but even up all the way up to buses and trains, all of these things are gonna have to be electrified eventually, right? There's a lot of policy and cultural and infrastructure shifts that need to happen between now and then, you know, to make that possible. And light duty consumer cars, the ones that we all drive is the perfect testing ground for all of those things. Um, you know, so I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I think electric vehicles and electric cars are the solution to all of our energy and transportation problems, because I don't think that at all, um, but I think they are a very, very necessary um, and really needed first step that we'll have to take. So with that, I think I'll throw some, leave some extra time for questions. Um, I'd gladly dive into any of this more deeply, but um, with that, I will send everything back over to Jen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, and thank you to all three of our speakers for, pre for providing really amazing and inspirational insight into the work that you're all doing. Um, and I'd also just like to thank you all for your contributions to this field. Um, so I would now like to invite all the speakers back on for the Q&A um, session. All right, and so we have a few questions, but um, anybody that's listening in, please feel free to ask more. Um, the first question we got, um, I believe this one was kind of directed at Professor Wright, but anyone is free to add in. Um, but the question is, how can we build the technologies and build capacity within the communities for which the technologies are being developed? I can start, but I actually think that is relevant probably to all three of us and a little bit addressed by Marie at the end there, but um, fantastic question. I didn't get to talk a, a whole lot about the process that we use when we're developing new technologies, at least in our research group. Um, so first of all, the community is involved from the very beginning. Um, so we saw a picture, for example, of me sitting with a community. However, we also try to actually create to train local community members um, in doing some of the group facilitation and design work so that we are not the ones implementing in the end. Um, so both in terms of that training as well as in terms of our implementation partners, um, at least for my work I'm always working with a local company and it's going to be sold by that local company. Uh, it's not um, it's uh, we try hard for us not to be the face actually of what ends up getting installed. Um, that's partially for the reasons that you mentioned of trying to build capacity within not necessarily even the immediate community, but within the country itself um, or region, but also because we don't um, uh, and also because you tend to get different responses depending on where you're coming from. Um, and so, for example, if we're asking for feedback on the system, we're going to want feedback from uh, the local population to local population and not necessarily directly to us. The other thing I would say is that in general, the communities that I've worked with are very resourceful and innovative. And so what we've seen, um, for example, in some of the rural reverse osmosis plants is that yes, maybe some company comes and installs or an NGO comes and installs 
a small scale water treatment plant. But then there's, there's kind of these little companies that build out of that. So people that drive their bikes around transporting the water or people that develop a way of tracking the water purchases in the community. And so sometimes uh, there almost always are jobs created in the process of installing the system. And it's kind of just an issue of if you're doing that intentionally and can we be more intentional about that versus if that just happens as a byproduct. Um, but I would actually like to hear the other speaker's perspective in the US when we're talking about um, you know, installing solar systems and how do we not just make that, perhaps how do we not just make that a, you know, donation or government subsidy based system, how do we actually bring the community into that? Hi, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think what you mentioned really makes sense. I think also the community needs the right tools to do some of these technologies, um, be it a subject matter expert, be it a appropriate finance mechanism, um, but they should always be, and this is something, like, like I, the quote at the end too, right? They need to be involved through every step, including the planning and the implementation phase. It's, it's widely important. And you know what they say about, you know, being a good, it's almost like being a good manager, right? You don't want to be the micromanager, but you want to provide them with the resources and tools that they need to succeed because they need, they know what is needed for their community. Like you don't, right? Like you can have some sort of opinion, but really it's the community that knows what's best for the community. Um, yeah. Um, and I was just going to touch on what you said, Crystal, about financing, because I think that that's, there's a lot of dignity to that, right? You think you always want to avoid the, the being the savior and, and result, you know, resorting to donations and, and generosity, right? But how are we actually empowering people to make choices and decisions for themselves and their communities, right? So are people able to invest in energy efficiency upgrades and, and solar panels for their house that's going to increase their property values, right? And, and be, um, have these multiple uh, long-term returns for themselves. Awesome, thank you all. Um, I have a question for you, Marie. Um, so someone said, I'm currently working with New York utilities to implement their EV Make Ready program. How can utilities ensure that their programs are beneficial for low to moderate income customers other than carving out incentives? Sure. So um, a huge piece part of this is access to charging. Um, you know, um, a lot of, as we talked about earlier, a lot of low income people are going to be renters. They are not gonna have garages and off street parking. Um, you know, you are, maybe you're parking in a lot, you're probably parking on the street often. Um, so how do you have access to, to charge an EV? Um, you know, you're either working with, you, people need to be working with uh, property developers, right? So as we build more multi-unit dwellings, um, multi-family homes, are, are we thinking ahead to getting ready to have EV chargers in those places? Um, are we working to install public chargers in the right-of-way, in, you know, public lots, um, and not just in the wealthy neighborhoods? Or are we preparing to do that equitably around town? And utilities have a huge role in that, right? Because I think as you think to the future, Right, our energy demand is is increasing with or without electric vehicles, right? So there is a lot of work that needs to be done there anyway. There's already investments going towards this this smart technologies and these these grid upgrades. So doing it now for EVs just just makes sense, uh, both from a planning perspective and uh, a money perspective. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so kind of going back to kind of the first um, question we had. Um, but how do you engage community members to get on board with implementing these technologies? And then also, how do you convince policymakers that these technologies are important to implement and promote? And again, anyone is free to answer this. I can touch on that a little bit. So what I found the most beneficial, and this is again not but we call it, what is it? Like, it's not a silver bullet, it's a buckshot, right? Like you're splattering everything, you're trying to hit as much as possible. Um, one of the opportunities I've seen is share the value streams and really emphasize the value streams of certain technologies. So for example, I tried mentioning 
on the, the solar plus storage is that that had many different benefits. It not only helped a tribe when there was a disaster, or not a disaster, when there was a challenge, but it also helped the community itself. It also, um, there was like many different benefits that came from just one technology about it's a it's a little bit of a sophisticated technology but sharing just the different value streams um, can really help move that conversation forward i would say on on in the communities i work with often at least in the water space it's it's a technology or a need that they're requesting and so i think the initial um you know, as Crystal mentioned, like the community knows what they need and that's part of why we're in that community to begin with um, and having the conversation with them. So I think I, I tend not to struggle as much with convincing or having the conversation about the desire, for example, for a desalination system, where we struggle more is with the pieces that make it an environmentally friendly or sustainable system that maybe folks don't want to help uh, with the initial investment for. So for example, what do you do with the brine that comes out of the system? Um, or how do you, you know, how do you not, um, how do you work together to frame the importance of all the aspects of the system and not just, and not just you'll have clean water or you'll have energy out of these solar panels, et cetera. So I think for us, it's, it's, um, it's more about the messaging of the collective system, making sure that from the very beginning, those pieces are part of the message that it, you know, you, you can't get the water without the safe way of dealing with the brine. Um, those those aren't mutually or they're I mean, aren't mutually exclusive. So I think for us, um, or that some tends to be something that we play with more is is not necessarily the the primary technology that's the issue, but how do you make sure that that all of the facets that come with that technology are still done in a sustainable way? And I would say because I'm often in the opposite situation of Natasha, right? We are trying, often trying to convince people to make transitions, right? Um, is that messengers really matter um, and that we're not going into communities that we're not a part of and trying to dictate what is needed and, and what the best next steps is that we are, you know, working with folks that are active in those communities already um, and that understand the needs and, and our trusted, trusted voices. Um, and that we're really taking on a listening role. Finding trusted voices throughout the whole process, like yes. super critical and finding those partners that the community uh, trusts and relates to. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, so our next question is kind of more like career focused, I guess, but how do you find a job or organization that values the intersectional approach to clean energy especially in a time like COVID um, when smaller organizations might not be um, hiring or have the capacity to hire during this time. I think that there's nothing wrong with, you know, trying to implement your values from the inside out, right? So if, if your dream job right now is unavailable because it's with a tiny nonprofit that doesn't have the budgets to hire you, there's, I don't think anything wrong with, you know, taking a job that doesn't align with your values on paper and, and doing good from where you are. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with developing your skills and trying to change culture along the way. So that's how I would answer that question given um, COVID. <laughs> There's also a really, there's growing interest in this idea of intersectionality, both um, like even from big organizations or maybe not intersectionality so much um, in my in my role, but interdisciplinary work. So I'm in an engineering department, for example. And so me pushing back on the importance of doing that social work at the beginning, the work with the community of understanding needs and interacting with all these different partners sometimes isn't seen as traditional engineering. And so I might get pushed back from that. But, but the messaging around why that's important um, is something that I think in the last 15, 20 years <laughs> has really grown. Um, and so I 100% I agree that I think you can, um, 
don't necessarily take a job description and think this is exactly what I have to do. Like find, find your way to, to weasel those values in to what you're doing if the company doesn't already have them. And don't be afraid to ask them, you know, during an interview, for example, if you're, if that's something you're passionate about to say, you know, I'm interested in this part of the technical job or, or whatnot, but you know, I would, I'd be interested in starting this type of initiative. Is that something that the company would support? Um, yeah. I would make another plug for public service. <laughs> we are always running. <laughs> um, but I liked what you said, Natasha, about values. I, I think that's really important. Um, and that's actually, I love that idea. You can ask that at the end of an interview. What are the values of this company? What are the values of your organization? And really try to align yourself. And this is a hard time. I, I think we all recognize this is a really unique time. You no, know, like we really have never been through this and we're lucky that we do have the technology to enable us to work remotely and virtually. Um, so it's, it's just very different right now. All right, awesome. Thank you all. Um, I think this will probably be our last question for the night. Um, but so this was directed at you, Professor Wright. Um, it, this person asked, where do you see the future of international research, especially since COVID-19 has impacted travel? Um, but I guess I think that this question can also be extended to all three of you, just in terms of kind of how this impacts like maybe mass transit and like the electrification of that um, or just any other topics as well. And how do you interact with, I think all three of us have stressed the importance of either directly interacting or interacting through other actors with communities, right? As part of this role of building these relationships and trust and initiatives. Um, so on my end, it, it's been interesting to be honest. <laughs> like I was hired into my role to do international development engineering and now I can't travel. Um, and so that is a challenge. Um, we've, uh, for my lab personally, we've been exploring uh, ways of doing virtual and online types of design reviews and what it would look like with some of the communities that we work with that aren't used to technology to try to do that. We've also been trying to start an initiative where we um, are training local um, students to do the type of interactions that we might normally lead, um, that those students would be there for, but that we would normally lead. And we're and that's actually been a fun initiative we're trying to push towards. And as far as um, really finding those lo local players that can uh, can accent the project. And I actually think that's even, perhaps might even be, end up being the better solution, to be honest, in the end. So uh, we're still plugging away. Um, it, I think a little bit for us, it depends on how long these restrictions continue to stay. Um, to be honest, from an academic research perspective, I'm starting to pivot as the keyword everyone likes to use um, some of my research into applications in the United States as well that I can travel more readily to. So um, there's demand for small scale distributed water treatment in the US as well. Um, there's need here as well in resource constrained settings and with communities that are have, have resource constraint. Um, there is need for large scale systems that we can translate our research up to. So from a funding perspective, because of some of the limitations, to, uh, to be perfectly honest, some of my research has had to shift slightly to the United States context. However, um, I would say that we're also playing around with creative ways of getting, getting the content we need from our international par partners uh, while we can't be there. And hopefully we can go back as soon as we can. That's about all we <laughs> I guess I can say on that for the moment. I don't know if Marie or Crystal, either of you had any input? Yeah. I, I, I haven't done international work in a while, but I, I did do a lot of domestic traveling that has ceased. And I, I have found, again, we're, barely, we're really lucky that we have the internet. <laughs> we, have, we have the means of communicating virtually with the video quality that we have. Um, so I think that's, that's been really surmountable. Um, to if doing efficient work. Um, I will say though, looking at the other side of it, the opportunity to participate in something like this, right? Like I think that folks, you know, might not be able to participate in certain panels or even have the uh, bandwidth to travel or even the finances to travel, but 
it's almost a, 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 an equal playing field of opportunity to participate in certain activities. So that's just another thought of that too. Right, a ton of benefits. I've been to so many incredible talks that I wouldn't have normally made it out to as a result of everything being online, so. It is, uh, it is definitely a wake up call, you know, um, all of this, right? Uh, I think, you know, as, as so many people are working from home and not traveling, right? You think of in, in April and May when you could see across LA for the first time in, in years or London or, or all of these cities across the world, right? And we're seeing such direct and obvious corresponding co correspondence between our air quality from transportation and energy generation and public health, you know, and, and I think we're thinking about that for the, for the first time really um, as, a, as, a, as a public. So I think as we go back to normal, I, I think that's gonna look very different. You know, I think it's gonna be people taking advantage of, of working from home and, and telecommuting and, and hopefully um, engaging in, in more sustainable uh, energy practices. Trying to think, of, trying to think of the silver lining among uh, amongst all this. So, awesome! Thank you all so much, and thank you for a great Q and A session and for um, presenting on the amazing research that and work that you are all part of. Um, and so, um, just to end, I have some final remarks before we end for the evening. Um, but I'd also just like to thank everyone for attending and calling in tonight. Um, we're so excited that you were able to join um, and hope that you enjoyed today's session and learned a little bit more about clean energy and the um, relation to social impact. Um, I'd also like to mention that our final sessions of the clean, Women in Clean Energy Conference um, are this Saturday. Our keynote speaker is Susan Brennan, the COO of Bloom Energy, um, and she will be presenting from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time, and then that will be followed by a panel session on discovering your vocation um, in the clean energy field from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, after the conclusion of the session, uh, you will be brought to a survey. Um, so we would greatly appreciate any feedback that you might have um, if you are able to take the time to fill it out so that we can prepare for next year's conference and then also potentially plan some follow-up events as well. After the conference sessions, we will also be sending out a follow-up email with some materials, including presentations, contact information, um, and as well as some information from companies who are currently recruiting. Um, one company that is currently recruiting is ICF, an international consult consulting firm with divisions across clean energy and climate change. And they will be recruiting for positions in their energy environment and infrastructure group. Um, so we will be sending out this information um, with a list of available positions within the company. Um, so thank you all again so much for attending tonight's session and um, any other sessions you may have had the opportunity to um, join in on and I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>